so important. So um, we're going to move back, shift gears again, back into a clinical topic. We're going to get into, we have two asthma topics today. We're going to start with pediatric, and then we're going to move into adult um, later on in the afternoon. All right, so you'll see a lot of the same themes coming up over and over again between these two. So we'll start with pediatric severe asthma in the emergency department. The numbers, one out of 10 kids in the United States have asthma. What's the morbidity? Two-thirds of those kids will miss school days. Um, in, in 2008, those were the numbers, 66%. And then mortality, we had about 185 kids die of asthma in the last check in 2007. So we're going we're gonna to go through a few things. We're going to go a little bit over um, the protocols, the NIH guidelines for asthma. We're going to go over some of the, uh, the medications. And then we're going to go over some non-medical therapies uh, for asthma. Talk about whether or not they work, all right? So we'll start with the role of evidence-based protocols on pediatric and young adult asthma admissions. That's abstract number one. This was a UCSF study um, <clears throat> where they had about 900 kids before and 400 kids after, before putting in the NIH guidelines and after putting in the NIH guidelines. And they found that after putting in the NIH guidelines, they got better control of patients' asthma to the point where they weren't getting admitted as much. So that begs the question, what are the NIH guidelines? What are there? There's three components to the NIH guidelines, sort of a little checklist we go through every time to make sure we're uh, giving proper care for these patients. So number one is giving the right medications, so the albuterol and then making sure they're getting their steroids on their way out. Um, and also getting the steroids in the ED or as part of the NIH guidelines, getting them within the first um, hour, hour and a half, uh, that's, that's part of the guidelines. The second component is the timing, which we just talked about, making sure you get the medications in a timely manner. Uh, and then the third component is the education piece, which I think is usually lacking. I notice in my own practice, I'm not so great at providing education on making sure they know how to use their MDI, ensuring that they have good outpatient education and follow up with their PMDs. That's the last component of it. Um, one part of the NIH guideline that's sort of controversial and is currently being studied is the um, peak flows, whether or not we need to measure peak flows very early in their course within that hour. Um, we don't have great literature to support that practice, and one of the folks over, Brian Driver over at Hennepin, is actually studying whether there's any impact on patient outcomes by us doing these peak flows rather than just monitoring them based on their clinical symptoms. Okay. So abstracts number two and three have to do with the mode of delivery, MDI versus nebulized is abstract number two. Are they just as good as each other, MDI versus neb, or is one better than the other? Pretty equivalent. And so uh, this abstract number two is about provider resistance and incorporating evidence-based medicine. Hey, if we know that MDIs are just as good as nebs, why are we always given nebs? Part of it is, I think, ease of use in the emergency department. But this uh, study in Singapore was a pre and post study, 10,000 patients before, 10,000 patients after. They implemented an MDI pathway, so docs or providers would give the MDI. And it, they found that, sure enough, after they put in the pathway, there was more compliance using the MDI versus NEBS. So I, I, I'm still using nebul Our RTs still like to use nebulizers in our emergency department. I think it's just fine. Part of the reason I think it's fine is a lot of times there's multiple things going on, and putting the nebulizer on and walking away is a lot easier than sitting there and teaching how to use the MDI. But at some point, it is good for someone to be at the bedside teaching um, about the MDI. And why is that? So abstract number three is a pretty interesting little paper from the University of North Carolina talking about patient um, like health literacy on how to use their MDI, particularly in kids. So they actually audio taped the medical visits of 300 kids seen by 35 providers for asthma. And they found that only about 5% of the kids asked to use, were asked to demonstrate the use of their MDI in these 300 visits. And they found that uh, only about, uh, was it 5%? Let me get that exact number for you. Yeah, only about 8% had good technique with the MDI. So they audio taped them, only 5% were asked. Then the researchers went in subsequently and tested the kids, and only about 8% actually knew how to use the MDI. So huge lost opportunity for uh, providing patient education. 
And we'll see when we get to the adult studies, adults aren't much better in actually using the MDIs properly. I almost think there should be an iPhone app or something that walks you through it. You know, we have apps for everything. I don't know if we have an app for that. Um, abstract number four, is levalbuterol better than albuterol? You guys remember this whole thing years ago? This is a study in 2005 um, when <coughs> we, uh, albuterol has these two isomers, the R and S isomer, anti-isomer, and then the levalbuterol is a selective, has a selective chemical, and they thought that, hey, it would be better um, for asthma symptoms if we used levalbuterol. What did the studies all show? That levalbuterol was more expensive, yet didn't really provide much of any uh, cl uh, clinical benefit. This was the double-blind RCT of 140 kids with moderate to severe asthma, and they found no differences in number of NEBs given, admissions, length of stay, any of the important outcomes. Is anybody still seeing levalbuterol or using levalbuterol? Once in a while? Is it for when they have real, a lot of tachycardia? Is that? No. Okay. So I think in select cases, but definitely we shouldn't be routinely using levalbuterol over albuterol, and this is a long time going, um, so we're just going back in time in some of the literature. Speaking of, um, who remembers the FDA ban on CFCs, the chlorofluorocarbons, when all those things were going on with the ozone in 2005? And in 2009, all of a sudden, the ban started to apply to these albuterol inhalers. What did that do to the cost? It went from a really cheap, easy to get medication. Jim was just saying they gave them out. Why did they have to give them out? Well, the drug companies jumped on the opportunity when we banned the chlorofluorocarbons and changed them to hydrofluorocarbons, made them HFA to be safer for the environment. All of a sudden, albuterol went on patent, and the price went from 25 bucks to around 75 bucks which is a huge deal for all our uninsured patients who have asthma and have asthma at higher rates than, uh, than our insured patients. So uh, next question that we ask here is, is continuous nebulization of albuterol more effective than intermittent nebulizations? Abstract number five. This was a pre and post study where they implemented a continuous nebulized albuterol protocol in their emergency departments and the rates of continuous nebulized albuterol went way up. Now the protocol, if you read through the study, is a little little interesting. They gave the kids a trial of one hour of albuterol, and if they didn't succeed, they didn't pass, they didn't improve much, they did three more hours of continuous nebulized albuterol. And one of the negative things that they found with continuous nebulized versus intermittent was that length of stay went up. Well, shoot, if you're going to make a protocol where people got to stay for three hours, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go up. And were they, so, but what they were looking at was were there any clinically significant outcomes that changed uh, in terms of uh, between nebulized and intermittent? And they didn't find that asthma scores changed much whichever way you went. And they basically said, you know, intermittent is just as fine as continuous. But again, I just go back to ease of use. In a busy emergency department, I'm fine doing intermittent, I'm fine doing continuous. But I'm more fine with making sure my RTs and nurses are free to do what they need to do. So I'm totally fine putting the continuous on and then being able to walk away. It's a little bit easier um, on everybody in terms of resource utilization. You'll just realize there's not much of a difference between continuous versus intermittent in, in a lot of these studies. All right, so let's, let's get into some of the interesting stuff. So this is some of the should know, must know papers on uh, pediatric asthma that are coming up. And the question that we're asking here is, are there some twists, we're moving into the medications, um, oral meds, are there some twists on ways to prescribe oral steroids? Let's get a survey. How many folks are doing oral prednisone or prednisolone for their kids? Big number. How many folks are doing DEX? So a lot less. So we have more of the pred versus the DEX. So this is, these are a couple articles that may um, make you think a little bit about what, one way or the other. So what, what's the problem with oral prednisolone or oral prednisone? What does it taste like? <laughs> yeah. If you throw some hot sauce and something on it, it might be okay, but it's pretty gross. It's pretty bitter. There are new formulations coming out that taste a little bit better, but if I were to tell an adult, any adult in the room, hey, I'm going to give you a medication. I'm going to give you two choices. One tastes bitter and gives you about a 10% chance of vomiting, and you have to take it for five days. Or I'm going to give you the option of taking a med that you take either once or twice, today and tomorrow. It tastes better and there's not a whole lot of vomiting associated with it. Which one would you choose? Option B. And we're adults. 
Now imagine we've given all this, I don't know why for years we've been giving kids this crappy taste in medication. Either one, make it taste better. Yeah, go ahead. Well, if it tastes bad, it must be uh, better medicine. <laughs> <coughs> Clearly. All right, so the, the next couple abstracts are advocating for consideration of the approach of dexamethasone in cases where you think it's appropriate. Abstract number six, single dose dexamethasone for mild to moderate asthma exacerbations. This was a study in Vancouver. It was a review article. They looked at some studies where patients got two doses of dexamethasone. Some got one dose of IM. One got one dose of PO. So they got various formulations of dexamethasone in this study. Overall, they found no differences in admissions, no differences in return to baseline clinical status at five days. And they basically concluded that single dose oral or IM dexamethasone is likely as good as a multi-dose um, course of steroids, okay? Any RCTs here? So abstract number seven is an off-sited study that came out of Ireland. A randomized trial of single dose oral dexamethasone versus multi-dose prednisolone for acute exacerbations of asthma in children who attend the emergency department. This was by Cronin and his colleagues in Annals of Emergency Medicine in 2016. This was a randomized controlled trial of 250 kids that either got oral prednisone for three days or they got a 0.3 milligram per kilogram dose PO one time in the emergency department. And they looked at the differences between those two groups. Now, some problems with the study it was single center, right? And it was non-blinded, so the doctors knew what, the, what they were given for, for each one. Um, and they did it in pediatric kids to age two to 16. They looked at a score called the PRAM, which consists of wheezing, retractions, and oxygen saturation. And they followed them after each intervention to see how their clinical status was. How did they do? There was no major difference uh, in PRAM at four days, so their symptoms were about equal at day four. No difference in return to ED visits, absence from school, activity, and all those other things. The one thing that the DEX group did worse at was they needed rescue steroids more often. 13% of them needed rescue steroids versus only 4% of the prednisone group. All right, so maybe there's a, a point for given prednisone, right? Um, a newer study that if you guys, we don't have it in the chapter, um, but it, you can look it up. It's a 2017 Spanish study. The first author is Paniagua, P-A-N-I-A-G-U-A, -A -A, Journal of Pediatrics, 2017. It was a randomized controlled trial of 800 patients, so a far bigger study, that showed no difference between giving two doses of dexamethasone versus the five days of, uh, of prednisone or prednisolone, which is, I think, more commonly given the five-day version. So they compared five days versus two days of dex, but their dose this time was 0.6 mg per kg. And they got it on day one, and they got it on day two. And they found equal, equal rates of symptoms, quality of life, admission, um, and everything else. All right? So my practice now is, now I think about it like just kind of the context of the patient. If it's a patient who's used to taking, they've taken multiple doses of steroids before prednisone, there's actually some patients and families that want the five-day course. They think having the five days will get them through and make them feel better. So I kind of do a little bit of shared decision-making with the patients and their families. Say, hey, look, we can give you, a, and I do the two-dose 0.6 mg per keg. Just want to give them a, a bigger, fuller dose, but give it over two days. Um, I'll give one in the ED, and I'll tell them they just need to take one more dose at home. Yes? No, I just get PO. Huh? PO. I want to make sure they can tolerate it. Right. So I'm just saying, oh, you can do that. You can do the IV form, but right. Then you, they get it from the. I just write it, and I don't know what what they do, but I'm sure that. <laughs> I haven't gotten a call back yet. Okay. I don't. I don't put specific, specific instructions, but I haven't gotten any calls back. Um, so anyhow, so you give them the option. Hey, give, do you want it for two days? See how they do, or you can give them the five-day option. I've had patients want one or the one or the other, but especially in your really non-compliant ones. Hey, you've gotten like this is the third bounce back, and you're you're really suspicious, or you don't think they're taking their prednisone, or they're telling you they're not taking it, or they're like throwing up a whole bunch. I think it's worth considering at least giving them the one dose in the emergency department. It has a longer duration of action, for up to three days, so and it'll kind of cover you cover you for that period. So it's another consideration in terms of compliance and non-compliance. And then the last study on steroids here, abstract number eight, 
triage nurse initiation of corticosteroids and pediatric asthma is associated with improved ED efficiency. So these were patients with kids, two to 17 years old, with moderate to severe asthma. And the triage protocol was, when you identify someone with moderate to severe asthma, give them the steroids right off the bat. We just said the NIH guidelines ask for you to give them within the first hour and a half. I think the first 75 minutes to be more, more exact. But um, they started giving these patients the steroids right off the bat. You do the albuterol, I think we're really good at getting that on board pretty early. But they gave the steroids really early. They did a pre cohort and a post cohort after the pathway. They found that there was a decreased length of stay and decreased admissions in the post um, early steroid cohort. So there may be some benefit actually in getting it as soon as possible um, on your initial order set for these patients. If they're able to tolerate it and they're not just wheezing up a storm. And if you need to, you can always, obviously, if they're in status asthmaticus, you can put an IV and give them the IV form. But um, most, most patients do okay with oral. All right. The next question is, are there advantages to giving inhaled steroids in the ED versus orally? This is abstract number nine. This is a systematic review meta-analysis of eight studies. Hey, instead of giving them this oral formulation and stuff, can we just pop a mask on and give it to them inhaled? And it, show, it showed that uh, the PO did, did better in terms of functional uh, 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 improvement. And they, but they did have a little bit of increased vomiting with the PO. If, you, if someone's vomiting over and over again and they're refusing an IV and everything else, I think it's just fine to try the inhaled steroid. But there's been all the studies on this have been really conflictual. Some say um, inhaled does just as well. Some say inhaled does worse. Um, I think for now, standard of care remains PO. But just keep that in the back of your mind as an option. And then next topic, magnesium. Freaking magnesium. Can we give magnesium for these asthmatics? I think the literature is pretty clear that we don't really know for, at least for the mild and moderate cases. For the moderate and severe cases, those are the ones we would think that it helps more when we're starting to put an IV and give IV mag. We're not doing those for the mild moderates anyway. This was a systematic review meta-analysis, a Cochrane review uh, from 2016 that looked, there's only five pediatric studies, randomized controlled trials, with a total of 180 kids. So we don't have a huge uh, power analysis to work from, but um, in those patients, the 90 that got mag, 90 got placebo, the odds ratio of hospitalization was about 70% less in the mag group. I think it's one of these things where it's low risk, you know, there's not too much risk associated with it, unless they have renal failure or something like that on top of it. But if they don't have renal failure, pretty low risk trying the magnesium and seeing if you can get them to turn the corner. We'll talk a lot more about mag and the adult, um, adult uh, thing. And I think it's 50, uh, 50 mg per kg, if I'm not mistaken. Double check me on that. But I, I believe it's 50 mg per kg for, uh, for kids, 25 to 50. All right. So we're all good. Any questions about the medications? Prednisone? Yes. Yeah, so we've seen in, in adults, like I've seen people giving them up to, you have like a 70 kilo person and you're going like 0.5 mg per kg, that's like 35 milligrams of things. Um, I, for kids, I usually stop at 10. Um, but I don't think there has been a max dose associated, but I'll usually stop at 10 for the kids. Yes? Of ketamine? So not well studied, but it, just hang tight on the adult side. We're going to talk about a, we don't have much evidence, um, but we will go through a really interesting case report about ketamine on the adult, on the adult side. And so, yeah, and a lot of people have, like, peri-intubation or using, yeah. So um, we'll talk about ketamine, and it's a really interesting um, drug, and I think a lot of folks have tried it with the really bad asthmatics, and we'll go into it. And, and some of the cases that we, we'll talk about in PEDS, They'll talk about giving max therapy, including ketamine, before going into some of the other interesting stuff that we're about to talk about. So non-invasive positive pressure ventilation uh, potentially does positive pre non-invasive positive pressure ventilation potentially have a role in severe pediatric asthma. So it's interesting. We always talk about asthma as being a problem of not being able to get your air out, right? And so we want to have treatments. And we want to have interventions that help you exhale better. But BiPAP and non-invasive ventilation is actually counter to that. We're pushing more air in. 
So how in the heck would putting a kid with asthma on BiPAP actually help? Yeah, so it does a few things. So you said prevents alveolar collapse, and it decreases work of breathing. So the kids that are really working to breathe, they can help with some of the, um, the respiratory muscle failure that they're getting. It can also help take some of that albuterol and the medications that you're getting inhaled, and it can help push them into those distal airways. So even though physiologically it doesn't make sense to put these kids on BiPAP, some kids do a lot better. So let's talk a little bit about some of the studies. There's not a lot of literature on this, but um, the first uh, paper here, abstract number 11, safety and clinical findings of BiPAP utilization for children, 20 kilograms or less for asthma exacerbations. This was done in Vanderbilt. They're looking at the little, little kids, like less than 20 kilos. And the natural concern would be you're putting BiPAP on a, in a little, little infant that you may just blow their lung out. They may get pneumothoraces. They may just get a lot worse. And do they actually get worse? So they had about 165 kids in this paper with status asthmaticus, terrible asthma. They ended up putting BiPAP on on an average of two hours, like within two hours. The average duration was between one hour to 90 hours, depending on the kid. Out of those 165 kids, only five of them pulled the, like, were just intolerant of it. So 160 of the kids actually tolerated it fairly well. One kid vomited, but was able to pull the mask off before they actually threw up. So what, what were the outcomes like? There were no pneumothoraces, thank God, no deaths in, these co in this cohort. And at baseline, they started out by getting an as asthma score between 0 to 15. The average starting score of severity was 12 out of 15. So these kids started out pretty sick. After BiPAP, they went down to about six. The, pro the problem is we're not doing a randomized control trial of no BiPAP versus BiPAP. Was it the medications that was doing it? Was it the BiPAP? But this was more of a safety and efficacy study showing that, hey, if we put the BiPAP in, we're not just going to blow out like these little kids' lungs, which is what a lot of folks are concerned about when you're doing it. <clears throat> so BiPAP by trained RT appears to be safe and may improve outcomes, but we're not exactly sure until we get an RCT. In comes abstract number 12. Safety, efficacy, and tolerability of early initiation of non-invasive positive pressure ventilation in pediatric patients admitted with status asthmaticus. This is a pilot study done in 2012 at St. John's Children's Hospital in Illinois. Small study. It was a pilot study of only 20 children who either got standard care with continuous NEBS and IV uh, steroids, oxygen, versus getting standard care plus non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. Their asthma severity score was from zero to eight. The average starting was seven out of eight severity, so these were also sick kids. If they got standard therapy, they went down to a severity scale of four. In if they got the BiPAP in addition, their average severity scale was 1.6. So it seemed that the BiPAP group did better in this very, very small study. Obviously problematic to extrapolate this with only a power of 20 patients, but promising for further study. All right, so you mentioned maskable therapy. We're gonna get into it. So we, we could potentially try in a kid that's really working hard to breathe, they're in status. A trial of BiPAP, we can try it, see if they get better in addition to the maximum therapy that we're giving which includes albuterol, which includes anticholinergics, which includes steroids, which includes magnesium in the real severe cases, possibly includes ketamine if you're going to try it, um, especially in a kid that you think is peri-intubation. This case report, I believe, is out of Israel. Manual external chest compression in severe pediatric asthma, August 2016. A 10-year-old presented with acute asthma exacerbation. They had no improvement with the kitchen sink. They got the IV mag, they got ketamine, they got all kinds of stuff. The docs, realizing the pathophysiology behind this, that there's too much air inside the chest, let me ask you, back up a little bit. We put a patient on a ventilator with asthma. Why is that bad? Air trap, auto peep, they get pneumothoraces. You get all this positive pressure ventilation, that's why we're, we, they, we wanted to study it in non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, because in intubation, you get all this dead space, and the patient has even harder time getting all that air out. Plus, you're breathing them at a certain rate. They need, an asthmatic needs to breathe like this. To get all that air out. 
So you gotta increase your expiration times on the ventilator, you gotta change all the settings, you gotta mess around, you gotta make sure their peak flows aren't, their uh, plateau pressures aren't too high, because if you don't make sure to do that, all those air, all those alveoli are gonna do this. And then you're gonna put, before they can fully exhale, they'll get another breath, and another breath, and they'll get barotrauma, and then you got a problem. So, when they're on the vent and they get hypotensive, what are the three quick interventions that we do every single time? Yeah, so we take them off the vent and manually push the air out, right? So we got a lot of air trapping. The first thing you do when the patient has hypotension in the setting of asthma after being intubated, we disconnect the vent, we push on the chest, get that air out. The second thing we do is we listen for breath sounds. If they're decreased breath sounds, bilateral chest tubes or bilateral uh, needle uh, thoracostomies to see if you're getting a rush of air to get rid of any pneumothoraces. And then the last thing is we give IV fluids because they get all that insensible fluid loss. All right, so let's take that same concept of air trapping and barotrauma in a kid that hasn't yet been intubated. And this is what they found. This patient got the kitchen sink. The doctors, providers realized that, hey, this patient probably has too much air in their chest. Let's do manual external chest compressions. Let's see if that works. They did it at a rate of 15 per minute. And they continued for 90 minutes. For a total, I just calculated before this lecture, 1,350 compressions to the lower chest of this kid. And they note that they had rapid improvement of the patient's symptoms. And that if all else fails and you're trying to keep the kid from being intubated, consider pushing on the chest to push air out of the patient's chest to get them feeling better and pre prevent air trapping. They also are careful to say this is not standard of care, which it's not, um, and that the complications may be arrhythmia or hypotension and all those other things. So just know that you're doing it with some risk. I'm not standing up here saying do this. If you think a kid has a bunch of air in, maybe it's worth pushing on their chest and putting it, put, trying to push it out, yeah. They actually pushed on the lower chest and up, like from the sub xiphoid. Lower chest. Uh huh. Like cardiac compressions, like external compressions. So listen, it's it's one of these last ditch things that's not really based in the literature. We're talking about a case report. They're reporting it. It was interesting. We talked about the kitchen sink. It might be worth. I'm not. I'm not. I don't think I'd ever sit there and do 1,350 compressions on a kid. I'm just not going to do that. I'm gonna do the things that I, I think around. But it, but it is an interesting concept to actually physically try to push the air out of the chest the same way we do in intubated patients. All right, and let's finish up here with abstract uh, number 14. What elements should be considered with regard to discharge medications for children treated with at least moderate asthma in the, in, in the emergency department? So it's going back to a lot of these NIH guidelines that we need to get them home on um, inhalers, we need to get them home on steroids, and if they're beyond just intermittent asthma and they're persistent, the guidelines tell us that we should consider putting them on some sort of inhaled steroid. So those are all the things we know. This was a retrospective review of 650 kids at six Canadian pediatric emergency departments to see what the variability was between physicians and actually providing all the proper discharges in concordance with the NIH guidelines. What did they find? They found that only a little over 50% of the patients got albuterol, MDI, and steroids, even got the proper medications. On a positive note, less than 3% got antibiotics. So that's good. They were antibiotic stewards. Um, the overall uh, message here is that there was a lot of variab variability in terms of getting them on the right medications, giving the right patient education, um, and then adding on the inhaled steroids in the, right, in the, um, the proper cases. And that's just to be mindful of that. We're going to talk a little bit more about patient education. So the key points here, we've got to get them on the right meds. Don't forget the steroids. Think about steroids early. Consider dexamethasone in, in the patients where you think it's appropriate. And then uh, BiPAP and things in, in severe cases, you can give them a trial. It seems to be safe. We don't know how effective it is yet. Okay? Yes? For two, yeah. So some of the studies were one day, some were two days. Um, but yeah, it's a, we could do it in one or two days in varying doses, 0.3 to 0.6 mix per cake. Yep. Uh huh. Yeah. There's there's so much potential for uh, for that for the nasal cannula.